Ladies and gentlemen, welcome at the presentation Revolutionizing Transport at the Speed of Sound. But before I start my presentation, I would like to show you this graph. And this graph shows you the development of the computer. And what you see here are the amount of transistors on a square millimeter. And what you can see is that from the 1970s, this has increased till now over 100,000 times, which is extremely much. And this shows that the innovation in this sector has gone very, very fast. But if you take a look to the world of transportation, in 1970, we were already flying in Boeing 747s. We were already yeah, traveling with the same trains as we do almost now. So in the world of transportation, nothing much has changed. But there is really a need for faster and a more efficient way of transportation. So it's time for innovation. And my name is Tim. I'm the team captain of the Delft Hyperloop team. And it's my honor to present to you the future of transportation. But before I do that, I would like to point out the current transportation problem. And this picture describes this very well. What you see here is a guy, he's cycling against the wind. And as you can see from his face, it takes him a lot of power to do that. And that's just because he's pushing away air particles. But not only this guy is doing that, no. Every current transportation system is continuously pushing away air particles, making them use a lot and a lot of energy. And we all know that energy costs money. Plus, the, the infrastructure required for the current transportation system is very severe, making them cost a lot of money as well. And thirdly, just a single leaf on the railway can lay down the whole transportation system, and that's not something we want. So ideally, you'll see a transportation system that is more efficient, has lower costs, and a higher reliability. But how can we, re how can we, re re how can we realize that with the Hyperloop? The Hyperloop is a sort of a train in a low pressure tube powered by solar panels on top. And here's how that works. Vehicles are leaving rapidly after each other in a tube, but it's not a normal tube. On the tube, there are vacuum pumps attached. And those vacuum pumps, they suck out the air till there is 0.1% of the air density left. And then it's possible to travel way faster through the tube. And because there's almost no air resistance, you just need linear motors at the beginning and somewhere halfway and at the end of the station used for acceleration and also for a deceleration where you can regain the energy that you have used during the acceleration, making it a very energy efficient system. And this will make it possible to travel from Amsterdam to Paris in just 30 minutes. Because if we look to the speeds, we can reach speeds higher than an airplane up to 1000 kilometers an hour and that with the energy consumption magnitudes lower than those of the current transportation systems. And to put these values more in perspective, I've made a small comparison. If you want to travel from the Netherlands till the south of France, which is around 1,000 kilometers, so it will take you one hour with the Hyperloop, and you compare it with the energy that is contained in a Tesla motor, then you would just need 20% of the battery of a Tesla to get you from the Netherlands till the south of France. So this really shows how energy efficient such a Hyperloop system can be. Well, is this like a substitution for all the transportation systems that are there now? Well, actually, uh, I will answer your question at the end of the presentation. Actually, it's more an addition to the current transportation system. If you take a look to the train, for example, the train is quite convenient. You just go to the station and you leave, but it's not that fast. And if you take a look to the airplane, an airplane is quite fast, but before you're actually in the air, you spend a lot of time at the airport, at the customs, taxi into the runway, so that's not quite fast regarding to an airplane. And what a Hyperloop is, is like a combination of the best of both worlds. We say that this is as fast as a plane, but as convenient as a train. And if we take a look to the distances where the Hyperloop is efficient, that's still around 1,000 kilometers. That's because after 1,000 kilometers, an airplane makes more sense because you do not require all the infrastructure. But till 1,000 kilometers, a Hyperloop system is efficient. And just imagine what you can reach when you cover all Europe with sort of a hub network of Hyperloops, then you can cover whole Europe with high-speed ground transportation. And that would, be, that would be really great. And I was already talking about going to the south of France, and that's quite a popular vacation destination among the Netherlands. So what do we see most of the time at the first day of vacation? Pictures like this, a lot of traffic jams. Well, when Hyperloop is there, times like this will be over. But not only times like this, also this is a very known image. A lot of trucks on the road transporta transporting cargo. The Hyperloop can also be used to transport cargo. 
And if you do that, you can take away all of the trucks from the road, solving a lot of the traffic jam problems as well. So this sounds all very, very nice. Did, did nobody ever came up earlier with this? Yes, they do it already in the 1900s, but it never really came off the ground until this guy, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla Motors and SpaceX, has written a proposal about a Hyperloop, and he's written that in 2013. And by that time, I was part of the Formula Student team of the TU Delta. We were building electrical race cars, racing among other universities. And during that time, we already said to each other, well, how nice would it be if there would come a Hyperloop competition? Well, one and a half year later, this became reality. SpaceX has launched the Hyperloop competition. So we did not have to think very long. So already one week later, after the competition was announced, we were started at Delft Hyperloop. So we went back to the Dream Hall, where all the big teams of the TU Delft house themselves. Probably you know them, the new one solar team. They're also housed in this building. We were getting an office, started thinking about how we could win this competition. But we found out that yeah, we were then with, with a group of four students. We could not do this alone. So we needed a team. So we were also were recruiting a lot for the best students possible to help us win this competition. Uh, and it was already in the summer, so we could not go to the university and say, hey, would you like to join us? So what we did, we were using social media, where we were putting posts on, hey, would you like to, to join our team, try to compete in this competition? And we got almost 200 applicants of students that are willing to join us. We were very surprised by that. And we, we thought that we need around 30 students to help us win this competition. So we also had a whole selection procedure, filtering out the most motivated, dedicated, and passionate students. And then we ended up with this team, a team of 30 students covered by all faculties of the TU Delft. So every area of technical expertise is within our team. And that makes it possible to cover such a wide design in such a short amount of time. But how do you organize such a team? Well, therefore, we have three technical departments. One technical head will make sure that all the departments are well working together. And one non-technical head, that's me, taking care of the non-technical stuff. Besides, we work hard, we also eat a lot with each other because most of the time we work in the evening together as well. Uh, but we not only eat, we also do some team building. We went paintballing to really boost up the team spirit. And we work together in a very close office, keeping the communication lines as short as possible, making it possible to work very, very fast. And this picture was, was taken in November. And around November, we had to deliver our conceptual design. And here you see image of our conceptual design. And this was also another milestone in the competition. This conceptual design determined if you would pass or fall out in the competition. And luckily, we've passed. And by passing this, this round, we were already quite a lot in the, in the media. You can see here we're on Radio 1, RTL, different new magazines, RTL News, and even New.nl, just with a conceptual design and a nice sketch. So actually, it, it wasn't much. It was much for us, but for the world, it does seem much. But this really shows that the world was really eager for innovation and innovation in this sector. So very motivated. We continued working because we needed our design to be designed in detail. And we presented it at first at the auditorium of the TU Delft on January 22nd. And we did it to our 600 people in the, in the room, together with more than 1,000 people watching our live stream. And we presented that with a video. And I would love to show you that video here. So in the name of our whole team, I proudly present to you the Delft Hyperloop design. Enjoy.
Thank you. <laughs> and here it is, the Delphi Hyperloop. I probably have seen this movie over more than 100 times, but every time I see it, it's, it's still amazing for me. But I guess you guys are all curious, how would I travel in the Hyperloop? And we want you to travel like a king at the speed of sound. So therefore we have made this sketch. You will be seated in very luxurious, spacious seats that gives you the idea that you're not in such an enclosed environment. And that will be made possible by having not actual windows, but screens pretend like windows, showing the environment passing by, which gives you the idea that you're not in such an enclosed environment. And we also made a nice virtual reality experience of this. And you can project even more on the walls like the streets or the cities you're all passing. And when you go to our website, you can also actually look around with your mobile phone in our Hyperloop vehicle, which is quite awesome. But I would like you to tell, I would like to tell you now more about the technique that we're using. And the one very special part of our design is our undercarriage. And this is how that works. We have permanent magnets inside our undercarriage, which are moving over an alum alum aluminum sheet. And by moving over such an aluminum sheet, you create a repulsive force in that aluminum, causing you to levitate at a certain speed. And we already levitate at 30 kilometers an hour. And here's how that works. By that movement, you create a repulsive field and you are levitating. And by the use of permanent magnets, you have a very safe system because your magnetic field cannot fall out like you have with electromagnetics, for example. Plus, you have a very energy efficient system because the permanent magnets doesn't require any energy. And furthermore, I would like to zoom a bit more in on our undercarriage towards our braking and stabilization mechanism. And here they are in more detail. And we also call these parts our guns. And as I wrote them, you probably see why. They actually look like, like guns. And because the competition is in America, we thought, well, we should might bring our own guns. But here's how that works. We have also permanent magnets centered around the center web. And we now know that you get a repulsive force when you move with magnets along a, conductive along a conductive track. So what happens when you go a bit off center? You create automatic repulsive field, which makes it possible that you have a very, very straight and smooth ride. But now comes the nicest part of this design. When you move those magnets very close towards the conductive metal, you also create a drag force. And well, you now think, well, drag, that's not something what we want. But when you wa want to come to a safe stop, some drag force is quite nice. So what we can do, we can slide those magnets along a rail very close towards the center beam of the track, making it possible to have a safe stop. But without any mechanical contact, any friction, anywhere, keeping the maintenance cost as low as possible. So here it is again, the Delft Hyperloop. When we presented this design the end of January in Texas, which was like the pre-final of the competition, where we had our booth here, and actually it was quite busy along the competition, but our stand was one of the most busiest stands at that competition. Probably because of our design, but maybe also because of this, we had some strobe waffles, which would really help to convince us the judges. And as you might know, It, it, it went quite well there. We ended up at the second place, just behind the MIT team. We were also really, really proud of that, especially because we are a European team in an American competition. We thought, well, ending up second would be the highest rank possible for us. We were very, very happy with that. And here you can see the prize, officially signed by Elon Musk himself. And I also had the opportunity to have a little talk with Elon Musk after the competition, which was, which was a great experience. And after this competition, it went all crazy with the media. We were in so many news articles, magazines, Uh, even Umberto Tan invited us at RTL Late Night. And last month we were also in a, a comic strip in the Metro about the Hyperloop. And this really shows that when people think about a new way of transportation, they are thinking about Hyperloop and also about Delft Hyperloop, which, which I think is really great. But what's yet to come now? Currently we have presented our design. We ended up second in the pre-finals. Now we're getting ready for the finals. We are actually building a prototype. We are making all of the aluminum materials, all of the caramel fiber materials. We're not only making a prototype, also building test setups, which makes it possible for us to test our stabilization and braking mechanism, our levitation mechanism, all by ourselves before we go there, which makes it possible for us to have it tested so we know for sure that it will work over there. And our test setup for braking and stabilization is already quite far. Here you can see a picture of it. And here's how it works. You have the big aluminum disc in the middle which rotates and simulates the speeds that you will have 
in our test tube. It will spin around with 400 kilometers an hour, and those magnets are around it, which makes it possible for us to measure the forces and to test our braking system and stabilization system all before the competition. And we do that in the city center of Delft. It is called the Padermark. We have here our office, and behind these doors, all the magic happens, where we have our own office, working space, testing all the stuff, assembling all the stuff, producing all the stuff, all by ourselves, making it possible to have the best, comp best high flu path for the competition. And at the end of June, we're going to present our high flu prototype towards the world. So keep track of this date. You'll probably see it in the news again. And afterwards, we will fly to California, doing some more tests on the small test set, and eventually to forming our run of glory at Rocket Road number one at the test track of SpaceX, building it now next to, next to the headquarters. And hopefully there we are the fastest, the most energy effective, the most cost effective, the most reliable and safest high flu pod, making it possible for us to win this competition. Oh, that's our goal. So what have we seen now? We've seen a guy cycling against the wind, making him use a lot of power. But not only this guy, now every current transportation system is using a lot of power. Well, the best solution for this is the Hyperloop. And the best elaboration of this concept is the Delft Hyperloop by its passive magnets, making it a very energy and fail safe system. But here's where it all started the development of the computers. Well, I think that in the world of transportation, development can also go quite fast. When you have the right people, the right mindset, the right persons in the right spot, it can go very, very fast. So, therefore, I believe that already in 2025, you can have your first Hyperloop system up and running, fully integrated in the current environment and probably you don't see it even but here it actually is and we are now laying down the first fundamental bricks by building testing designing a hyperloop prototype just in one year and that's what i call revolution action transport at the speed of sound thank you for your attention Woo. <laughs> so tim there's probably a bunch of questions ready to come from the audience but i think the obvious one is what happens if you win? <laughs> well, probably we'll get a lot of fame and fortune forever. So, that's, uh, so that would be great. And, and what uh, happens if you come second again? Which would be fantastic. Also a lot of but fame and fortune, but not, yeah. not that much as when we came first. But, but uh, would you stop but when or we would win? you carry on? Um, well, the competition is not yet, not yet certain if it will continue as well. Uh, it would be ideally if our design would be used to developed further, making it possible to have like have it in a real Hyperloop transportation system. Uh, but that's that's something that's not certain yet, so we'll have to find it out after the competition. All right, questions from the audience? There's got to be one somewhere. Hi. <laughs> oh. What's your name? What's your question? Yeah, Dirk, I was wondering if it's going to be expensive to travel with this. Actually not. The, the current costs are estimated if you want to travel from Amsterdam to Paris, for example. I think it would be around 20, 25 euros. So that's way less than you pay now for going to uh, Inskede, for example. Who's next? This guy. I'm Roger. Related to the, uh, your question about price, um, how do you estimate that price? Is that related to um, well energy costs and material, or also a whole company yeah. around it, including well booking, you have service? Um, two kind of cost posts that are your initial cost. Uh, which are necessary to actually build this and your running costs and uh, the, the costs that you have at the beginning for building this they are estimated with uh, how much money was spent by building a, a maglev railway system uh, scaling it down to the amount that we use uh, the material cost of a steel tube material cost of fillers uh, so that's how we estimate the initial cost and the running cost because there is no no friction no wear uh, there's also almost no maintenance, so the running costs are estimated to be very, very low. And when you take a lifetime cycle of 10 to 20 years, then uh, you, you probably win it back in, in that amount of time, making it possible to have very cheap tickets. Great. What's your name? What's your question? My name is Aaron, and I have a rather simple question. You are speaking about a vacuum tube, and I'm sorry to say, but I'm a little scared to sit in a vacuum tube, because a tube in a tube <laughs> means that if the inner tube explodes then I'm dead uh, well at least you won't care <laughs> well I'll probably have my brain splattered against the walls yes so I don't care <laughs> anymore uh, the thing is how do you prevent this because I see you use a certain uh, carbon 
fiber material as walls. Normal pipe. Exactly. Uh, but you also use glass for the piping, or is that conceptual? Uh, I <laughs> well, actually, to really go into Tell your us. question, uh, when you're in an airplane, you're actually doing the same, but it's way less safe because you're very high in the sky, so if something happens, you just fall down and crash and die. But if you crash in here, you just have a slide along the railway, making, it, yeah, making the chances of surviving way more higher. And how we manage the, yeah, the forces of the pressure dif difference, we're planning to do that with a carbon fiber chassis, which is a very strong and lightweight material. We're also using it now in the, the Boeing Dreamliner. So it is it's also a proven technology, because we think that it's probably very safe to use that. Yeah, uh, at first I think it's scary, but the first people taking an airplane, they also thought it was quite scary, and now it's like common sense to do that. So I think it's just a matter of time when people are used to it. Still got time for a couple more questions? Anybody? Yep. You've got like halfway. Yeah. What, what, what's the research budget? Well, currently we are a student team at the TU Delft. So, our budget so about is six euros 99. <laughs> <laughs> well, our budget is now zero because we don't have any, any income or stuff like that uh, and how we finance it is with with partnerships uh, we have partnerships with uh, also in-kind partners as well as financial partners the in-kind partners they help us with supplying our ourselves the, the materials and the financial partners they uh, supply us with some financials to help to realize this project because we do not only have to build this prototype we're also building the test setup because we're a new team we have to set up a whole workshop the All competition right. is in america so that there's some quite logistic costs to to go there and we finance that by, uh, by partners. So that was a very long answer, but it didn't actually answer your question, did it? You said how much. <laughs> didn't say who's paying. All right, well, you, you, you could buy some nice cars of it, I would say. All right, <laughs> I don't think he wants to tell us. Another question? <laughs> yep, all the way at the back. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? What's your question? My name is Olga, and my question is, do you know if Elon Musk also has a team of professionals uh, simultaneously working on the same uh, problem? Well, what, what SpaceX told us is that they, are, they don't have the time to work this completely out in detail. Uh, but they are really willing to, to help get this into the world. So therefore, they organize this competition. They are just building the tube. And they give student teams and companies the chance to build a prototype and see if it performs well. So SpaceX is not, not working on this uh, as well. Like sort of outsourcing it to cheap student labor. Exactly. It's quite smart of them. <laughs> well, you fell for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Luis. Um, what did the MIT team, what did the judges say made the MIT win over you guys? Uh, there was not, not a real specific thing that made the MIT team win over us. Um, Being American. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we think because we are a European team and a competition in America. The MIT school is like the, the biggest and the most popular technical school in the world. So it would be a shame for them to, to not win. Uh, and when you look to their, to their technical performance, for example, their, their braking system, they're making use of just mechanical braking shoes, pressing themselves along the tube, uh, which makes you have some, some friction, some wear. You can brake a bit harder, but you are also uh, sort of damaging the tube. Uh, so in our ID, that was not the most sustainable way that you can use for braking. Uh, but probably the judges thought it, it was nice, but there was like some kind of difference in the technical elaboration. All right, time for one last question. Yeah, hi. Hi, my name is Bogdan. Uh, how old are you, sir? Sorry? How old are you? I am 23. 23. So do you think by the time you'll be 50, you'll, you'll be able to travel to the south of France in one hour? When I'll be 50, yes. Yes. <laughs> so if that answers your question. So then I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. How does it get faster over time? What, what, what will be the difference between... Hyperloop 1.0 and 3.0? Uh, well, the first step of Hyperloop is that you reduce the pressure to like 0.1% of the air density. And that means that there is still quite some, quite some air left in the tube, so you don't have a full vacuum. But you can really yeah, pull this way further than you can do. You can start decreasing the pressure, decreasing it even more and more and more, um, going to the full vacuum, and then speeds of around five to 6,000 kilometers are also possible. But that's, that's more in, in the far future. The first step is high loop, and then you can start developing that further, making it possible to travel even faster afterwards. Oh, go on then. <laughs> uh, 
uh, the infrastructure cost per kilometer because those tubes are not cheap. What is it? I just got to check. Are you <laughs> working for the competition? Yeah. Okay, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you later what it is. No, come on. <laughs> Look. Give us an idea. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's estimated on half of the price of those of high-speed rail tracks. Right. I mean, I, r I remember when uh, Elon originally released his kind of sketches and said, you know, oh, I, was I was just doodling and, you know, this came out. And by the way, the northern to southern California high-speed railway line that still exactly. has not been built. Right. Right. They're building it now, actually. Oh, okay. And those cars were estimated at uh, 68 and a half billion euros. Right. And the high-speed railway track between those cities were estimated on 10 billion. So there's like magnitudes lower than the high-speed rail track. Yeah. Although there were a lot of... Uh, critical eyes on his cost estimation, so probably it would, would be even a bit higher, but still a lot yeah. cheaper than the, uh, the high-speed railway. Even if it was double, it was still half the cost, right? So More than half the cost. And, of course, it's California, so you had the earthquake thing to worry about, but that's a different game. Uh, what happens when that thing goes into an earthquake? Because those things <laughs> that's are not that's really not an That's not an aspect of our design at the competition yet. But, but, but can your uh, magnetic left system your maglev system, can that dampen for such events? Because well one millimeter on a uh, thousand kph system <laughs> is a lot of uh, yeah, that's a That's a nice thing, because we are actually not levitating at one millimeter, but at centimeters. So you have quite some play with your air gap. So the track doesn't have to be perfectly straight. So therefore you can also reduce the track heft even more. Uh, but the idea is that the tube is placed on pillars with some of dampers inside it. When you have an earthquake, it's still quite damp, and you can just keep your system running. So, yeah, or just not not break it very severely. I, I I guess that depends on how big the earthquake is. I mean, if we're talking about Dutch style earthquakes, I think you're going to be just Sorry. fine, right? All right. I think the next guys are uh, uh, just about ready. Dwight, you ready? <laughs> yeah, these guys are ready. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a huge round of applause. Tim and I forgot your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Marlene from T T U Duff. And now they all turn up when you're finished. You guys missed the best talk ever. You suck. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we do Thank have you. a small token of appreciation on behalf of the uh, campus party just Great. behind you. Coming oh. somewhere. There we go. Sure. Thanks. Uh, will you Thank hang you. around for some, uh, for some more Q&A with the guys if they want to come and find you? Will you oh be yeah, around sure. for 10 more minutes or so? Great. Yeah, He's great. prepared to take questions, so uh, maybe you'll get that uh, answer after all. <laughs>